All this was working uh, about half an hour ago. Sorry? Okay, that should be on. Is that on? Okay, we've just got to get this to talk to the... Haha, we're in. the play button. I actually did it in, um, there we go. Are we up? We're in. Cool. Okay, as often happens when you pass songs on to people, the words don't get quite right. Um, yesterday and forever, he's always the same. There's no reason to doubt God can do it again. Um, I've had that song buzzing through my head for the last three weeks since the Lord basically gave me this. Uh, a prophetic history of the church since World War II. And uh, a couple of months ago I was just driving around as you do and I was saying, you know, Lord, you know, I really just want to tell the stories of the stuff that you've done, the stuff we've seen, you know, what's happened. And, and uh, so this is pretty much it. So... We won't be doing a heavy theological session today. I'm just going to tell stories and hopefully we'll get through it. Um, it's one of those things where I honestly have no idea how long it'll take. So if we end up in doing it in two sessions, we'll do that. Okay, so we're starting at World War II. Most people know the basic bits. I don't know if you guys can see it all from that angle. You can? Okay. Uh, so 5th of May 1945, Victory in Europe Day. World War II finally ends. A couple of things that are really significant happen. The Allies, especially the US, decide they're going to rebuild the people they've just bombed into the last century. Rather than after the Treaty of Versailles in World War I where they basically said, it's all your fault, you're going to pay for it and basically set up everything up for World War II, they said, no, no, hang on, we're not going to do that. We're going to help them recover and get over what the Nazis have done. Uh, some of the events at the end of the war that were just horrific, you can see on the far right-hand side, the women in Berlin starting to pick up the rubble and rebuild. And uh, the first Allied officer into Berlin was a guy... Um, Oh, for crying out loud. Eugene Bird, he was a lieutenant at the time. He ended up the colonel in charge of Spandau Prison where Rudolf Hess was kept. And he said the devastation in Berlin at the end of the war had to be seen to be believed. And there was this thing called the Rape of Berlin where Stalin had basically said to his armies, whoever gets there first can do whatever they like with the people for two days. And I'll leave it to your imagination, but it really was that bad. It was so bad they actually went out of control for two weeks. And in the end, the officers had to start shooting their own men to get them to come back to barracks. And yet, after this, these women came out and they just said, because people would just say, I just bulldoze it, we'll rebuild over there. And they said, no way, we're rebuilding this. Um, the Nuremberg trials brought justice for the evils of the apocalypse, the Holocaust. Um, and of course, the big, big, big event, the Jewish refugees fled Europe, just droves of them, jumping on ships and heading for um, what is now the land of Israel, which in those days was British Palestine. And um, of course, the British couldn't stop them. It was either shoot them or let them come. And, of course, it led to the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel, which is a major biblical sign of the end times. So, just as all this is happening, 7th May 1946, William Branham is a stinkingly dirt poor um, minister in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And he has been having these full-on technicolour visions for years. And all these people he respected were saying, oh, Bill, that's not God, that's demonic. God, don't do that no more. And why would he tell you? You've got no education. And, and yet he sees these things and they happen exactly as he saw them. And he was just 
devastated. He just, what am I doing? This guy? So he decided, I'm going to have it out with God. So he went up to his cave. That actually is a photo of the outside of the cave where he used to take off into the hills and just wait on the Lord. And, um, and he was up there for several hours just begging God, deliver me, Lord. You know? And all of a sudden, all, sorry, I, where do I need to be? Somewhere, right. Uh, and uh, all these Bible verses started to go through his head that, you know, people getting visions in the Bible. And he said, well, well, maybe, Lord, this is really you and I need to repent of believing what those other guys have said. Uh, so he does that. Then this angel shows up and said, I've chosen you to take divine healing to the nations, the peoples of the world. If you'll be sincere, this is a direct quote, when you pray and can get the people to believe you, Nothing shall stand before your prayer, not even cancer. And he was given two signs. The first one, he would take the person's right hand in his left and he would get these swellings or bumps and vibrations in his hand and he learned to recognise what those things meant and what they were related to. And he'd pray for the person, the bumps would go away, they'd be healed. And he'd, he'd know, uh, you're healed. You know. And um, one of the guys who travelled with him said... I got so good at recognising what the things were. I could see the bumps and go, oh, yeah, that's that. You know, um, that was the first sign. And the second one was to tell by vision the very secrets of their hearts. And one of the video clips we used to have on the website, where I've been talking to Raf about getting all this stuff back because uh, we were one of the few places in the world you could actually research this stuff. And... Um, and this lady walked up on stage. He just literally reads her mail. Oh, you live at such and such. And, oh, and this is your problem, isn't it? You know, and blah, blah, blah. And you're healed, bang. And people said there were times when he would, not showing off, but just to demonstrate what God was doing, he'd turn his back to the audience and he'd pick a row and he'd just go along the row and tell everyone where they lived. And it wasn't showing off. It was to try and raise people's faith so they could receive from the Lord. And people would say, they'd be sitting in these meetings and, um, and the angel would show up and all of a sudden Brandon would go, he's here. And healings would just break out all over the place. And uh, so all this happened in 1946 and, of course, Branham didn't know what to do. What do I do with this? I had an angel show up. So he went to this guy who used to be his pastor who was now bishop of their whole thing and he said to him, look, I've just had this experience. And this guy's, oh, Bill, you know, why would an angel speak to you with your seventh grade education? You know, but I think you've been drinking the wrong mushrooms and whatever it was. And uh, he basically, go home, take a nap. So he's pretty disheartened. He goes into town. He just knows, you know, this is the Lord. You can't really argue with an angel. And, um, and he goes to get his pay from the shop. And he notices this guy hanging outside the shop. And he goes in, gets his pay, come out. And the guy's sort of looking around and he, and he said, look, mate, can I help you? And the guy said, well, yeah. He said, I had a dream and the Lord told me in the dream to come to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and a man called Branham would pray for me and I'd be healed. Set up. <laughs> so he prayed for him. The guy got healed. Now, what really struck me when I was going through this was he did not suddenly decide to make it happen. The Lord called him. The Lord told him to do it. He didn't know how. The Lord then set him up. And over the next couple of years, so many people would literally just show up in Jeffersonville. It's like the Alice Springs of Indiana. It's just way off the bit, you know, out the back of whoop whoop, not on the way to anywhere sort of thing. And people would just show up. Oh, I had a dream and God told me to come here and, you know, this guy called Branham would pray for me. Anyway, so just after that, um, cripples, blind, deaf were all healed. Uh, he... There was a guy from uh, St. Louis, I think it was, who asked him to come pray for his daughter. She got healed and that led to the first healing campaign. And the, the volume of people who would just drive hours and hours because they heard this stuff was doing, God was doing stuff. And you, you start researching this stuff, you'll find all sorts of negative stuff on the net. All, all, all the, the online Pharisees, you know, oh, he couldn't be God. Rumble, rumble. Um, and one of the things that struck me as I was going through it, and it's just completely fled my head. Oh, I'll come back to it. 
Okay, so word of the miraculous healings just explodes. You can see from the photos the crowds and crowds of people. Um, people coming spontaneously, divine encounters even happening outside the meeting. So Branham's walking in one day and um, just in the crowd, it was before people could recognise him on site, and there's this blind coloured girl, using their words, and um, she's, Daddy, Daddy, where are Daddy? You know, and he said, look, can I help you? And she said, oh, help me, sir. He said, uh, you know, I came to see the prophet and, and I haven't been able to get in the prayer line and, and now I've lost my daddy. And anyway, so he prays for him. She gets her sight back in the car park. You know, it was just everywhere. Stuff was happening. That was the point. A lot of the criticisms of the latter-day revival, the Voice of Healing revival, they were actually two separate movements that sort of split off from the same origins. Um, was people say, oh, there was a lot of elitism, you know, and there was a lot of focus on the individuals. There was, you know. Uh, anyone heard of a guy called Moses, right? There was a big focus on the individual. Do you know, God actually said to Moses, I'm going to exalt you among the people and they'll know my name's great. Right? God chooses to work through people and one of the ways I like to think about this stuff is it's the acts of the Holy Spirit through a succession of people who were not necessarily perfect, certainly weren't holy in and of themselves. Some didn't even walk in righteousness the whole way. Um, and yet they were available and God used them. And there's lessons to learn here, even from the mistakes they made and the things that they had to deal with down the track. So uh, T.L. Osborne, another name from then, encouraged to go to a meeting by his wife after she witnessed this deliverance. Uh, and God speaks to him, you ought to do this too. And that starts his, his ministry. Gordon Lindsay hears about the meetings. He meets Branham in Sacramento. And uh, Lindsay was the open door to the Pentecostal groups. And they all joined the team. And of course, um, uh, Oral Roberts, 1948, he visits a Branham campaign that starts him going. Now, what's really interesting is at the same time, it's not all Branham. Catherine Coleman was there doing her thing, and that's when the miracles broke out in her meetings at the same time, right? So it's really interesting when you start to, to line this up and see how it matches. But Catherine Coleman, she kept a distance from the Voice of Healing revival partly because of some of the elitism that did come out there. So 1948, same year, roughly the same time, President Truman recognises the modern state of Israel. Now that was groundbreaking. The entire world, a bit like Taiwan at the moment, you know, oh, no, 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 it's still British Palestine, the Jews can't claim that, and blah, blah, blah. And Harry Truman said, well, we're going to, ka uh, He was the first world leader to do it, uh, had a huge blue with his own Secretary of State. He was ambivalent about it at first, weighing up all the different things. Now, much, much later uh, in the 80s, we'll get to the actual events, but much, much later, Bob Jones is sitting with Mike Bickle and I think Mike said, how come this is all happening to us? And Bob said, well, he said, Lord told me, he said, the blessing was released on Harry Truman's hometown, Kansas City, because of the stand he took to recognise Israel. I mean, there's stuff God does that just boggles the mind and, and most, uh, most ministers are just completely oblivious to it all. So 48 to 57 was the Voice of Healing revival and some of the big names there, you've got A.A. Allen on the left, um, his little book, The Price of God's Miracle Working Power, uh, who's that in the middle? I can't remember. Uh, Jack Coe is the one on the right-hand side, I think. No, that's Oral Roberts. Middle, uh, Jack Coe. So, April 48, the first issue of Gordon Lindsay's Voice of Healing magazine was published, basically to focus on Branham. The next month, Branham was exhausted. He was staying up till 2 o'clock, praying personally for all these people and just burned out and needed to take some time off. And so the magazine started to report on other leaders' meetings. They actually, Branham actually owns the magazine and they showed up at his house, oh, we need you to sign these documents. He said to one of his guys, he said, they're coming to take my magazine away. He said, I'm going to sign it. 
He said, and, and then he, he asked them to stay around and preach for him. I mean, the character of the guy is incredible. So what, what it did, though, was it just exploded. And, uh, of course, there was just amazing stuff. You can see the size of the tents and names like A.A. Allen. All these guys became well-known. There's around 100 people who are all going around doing these revival meetings around the country. About 80% of them fell uh, into dramatic sin, girls' gold or glory. Many of the ministers got into a competitive rivalry, biggest meetings, the greatest miracles and stuff. And uh, the PDF book I did some years ago, The Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Voice of Healing Revival, that was all the healing testimonies from the magazines that we had. It's just all the healing testimonies. Uh, you used to be able to download it off our website. We are working at getting it back. Now, one of the things, um, if you're linked to our Facebook page, um, which is the same as the website address, you just put that into Facebook, you'll find it. And uh, we've been sharing some stuff there. Um, there was a three-part interview that Mike Bickle did with Paul Kane, and each one's about, you know, an hour 50 long, um, but it's fascinating to listen through. And Paul Kane was talking about this, and he said... He said the first years it was pure. He said it was about 52 that you've got these promoters coming in and all the competitive stuff started and oh, I've got the biggest tent and he said so what we did next time we set up was we lowered the centre poles by about two feet and stretched the tent out by a couple of feet so we had the big, you know. He said there was all this stuff happening that was going on. It sounds, sounds really silly now but back then it was a huge competitive spirit. 1951, one of the, the standout events, Congressman Upshaw, he was 84 years old. He'd been uh, paralysed back in 1884 when he was 18 years old um, and hobbled around on canes when he got mobile again. He'd been a congressman. He was known, widely known across the US. Goes to a Branham meeting, gets totally healed um, and it was coast-to-coast -coast news, you know, everyone knew this guy was a cripple and he's healed, and he then started uh, preaching himself. Um, oh, that's right, Branham actually had the vision. Young man falling from a haystack, breaking his back. That's their spelling, by the way, not mine. Um, a doctor with a white moustache and glasses working on the young man, no avail. He actually grows to become a famous person and people are applauding him. Upshaw was instantly healed and then died the next year, but he published his testimony and sent it to every senator and congressman. The youngest of the guys was this bloke, Paul Kane, who only died last year. And uh, Paul Kane, um, wow. Uh, I mean, Paul Kane and Branham were very good friends because they had very sim similar gifts. Great, this is what we need. I don't know what this is doing. Um, so even though there was a, a big difference in their ages, because Paul Kane was only about uh, 18, 19 when the whole thing started, um, but because they were very similarly gifted, they became quite good friends. And in fact, Paul Kane was the only one that Branham would send if he couldn't go to a meeting. He'd call up Brother Paul, Paulie, can you take it for me? And um, they had such a relationship that they would actually practice over the telephone. So, you know, they'd ring each other up. Oh, you're really good today. How am I? You know, and they'd practice across the country, seriously. And a very funny story from the 80s. One day, Mike Bickle, you know, he heard this story and uh, he's in Kansas City. He dials Paul Kane in Texas and, oh, brother Paul, you sound really good today. How am I? You know, ha, ha, ha. Paul Kane said, well, Mike, he said, your hair's wet and you've got a towel wrapped around your middle because you just got out of the shower. And Mike hung up. <laughs> he said, I thought we'd get him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, nuts. I'm not sure if it's the, the link, the cable, or the new battery. Doesn't help when you stand in front of it either. Try again. Um, 
So he had a miracle birth, um, 1929. His mother, 45 years old, she's had heaps of miscarriages. He had an older sister, Mildred, who was six, seven years older. Um, terminal heart condition, terminal leukaemia, uh, breast cancer had eaten away both breasts, three malignant tumours blocking the birth canal. The doctor said, no way that you nor the baby will live. Sorry, I've just been told I have to stay in the zone. And um, she was a very devout woman. She's praying in her room. This angel appears. Look, the child in your womb is a son. He's going to preach the gospel like my apostle of old. Touches her. She's instantly healed of the whole thing. Was written up in the hospital records as a miracle woman. And he was a breastfed baby. A uh, creative miracle. And uh, so he started preaching as a young kid. The Baptists didn't know what to do with him, sent him down the road to the Pentecostals. And he just always had this phenomenal gift of revelation. He just knows stuff. And so in the early days, he said, I, I, I really, I didn't have a lot of wisdom. I hadn't really been taught. And he said, I'd see stuff, I'd call it out. So he's in this meeting in San Francisco and this usher at the back. And he said, you old hypocrite. He said, this is your wife sitting around here and you're planning to run off with that lady over there after these meetings are finished. And this usher, oh, you leave him alone. He's not going to touch the man of God. And the guy comes to the front, paraglide hits him and he falls to the ground, looks up and little brother, what am I going to do? And he said, I didn't have any compassion, man. He said, well, that's for you to sort out. <laughs> he said, I just didn't know. Um, 52 began to film the meetings. 54 bought the world's largest tent from Jack Coe. 57, God began to speak to him about the excesses that some of these guys had got into, not just the sin, just the self-glorification, promotion. And He said, I will lead you to stand before a new breed of leaders who will not be corrupted by the three Gs. And so he wrote a public letter, cancelled his magazine TV show. He said, I only thought it would be a few years. <laughs> he went from 300 engagements a year down to about uh, three, three to five. And he said, every time you know, I get invited to come and do a camp meeting and I'd go there, the miracles would break out and I'd be thinking, is this it, Lord? Is this all? And I was like, no, nah, I still can't trust you. Back in your box, you know. And it's, like I said, the interviews are really interesting where he's talking about this stuff. And the Lord actually said to him, he said, I haven't been able to rest in you for 38 years. That was referring to 1952. You know, he said, I haven't been able to rest in you because he said, I've been complaining. Lord, I'm so tired. And the Lord said, well, what about me? I haven't been able to rest in you for 38 years. Go figure. Okay, 1956, January 16, 1956 in Chicago, William Branham. And if you look at the photo, you can see the halo of light around his head. That happened several times. There was a, a, a newspaper photographer who was actually anti all the meetings and he snaps this. And he, what the? And they said, no, it wasn't touched up. It wasn't lights. It was, yeah. And, um, but he gave this word, America, America, you've turned down your opportunity. You wouldn't come into unity on my terms. And he said, I'm taking it away. You've got 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, Branham prophesied the Lord was taking it away. Uh, the denominational differences, I mean, it's unbelievable what went on. The, the AOG, because Branham was a Baptist minister, and the AOG came along and said, well, you should be teaching people that they're not saved unless they preach in tongues. And Branham's like, no, I'm going to teach what the Lord's given me, not what you want. So the AOG then opposed everything, turned against it. They did much the same to A.A. Allen too. Um, Forty years on, so after all this, on the exact date, January 16, on the 40 years anniversary, um, Bob Jones had rang up Paul Keith Davis and he said, the Lord keeps telling me January 16, what's that about? And Paul Keith said, well, he said, that happened to be the date that Branham gave this prophetic word and everything shut off. And Bob said, you know, well, next January we should get together. So they talked to Rick Joyner, they'd invited Paul Kane, Bob Jones, their wives, all these people there in this cabin in Moravian Falls. And he said, this is before Moravian Falls was known as a retreat centre. And uh, they're sitting there at the end of this fire trail and Bob's like, no, nah, can't start yet. There's two more men supposed to be here. And they said, no, Bob, this is everyone who was invited. He said, no, nope, the Lord said, two more men. So they sort of sat around chatting. They had lunch. Look, we've got to start. So they, Paul Keith starts telling the story about Branham's prophecy. As he's telling it, a car pulls up outside, <laughs> stop, stop, 
bang, 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 <laughs> open the door. These two guys are here. Lord, I'm sorry. We, we, the Lord's led us here. We feel we, we need to be in here. And Bob's like, them's the ones. You know, so they come in, sit down, they start going through, Paul Keith starts all over again. And he gets in, and the old guy, white hair, 77 something years old, I think, Ray Kursky. And he said, I was there. And they're all like, he said, I was in the meeting. He said, I always wanted to hear Brandon preach. It was the only opportunity I got. And I was there on that day. And he said, You won't know this about me, which I personally would never say to a group consisting of Bob Jones, Paul Kane, Rick Joyner, Ed Howell, you know. But he said, I was the last disciple of John G. Lake. John G. Lake spent his last 18 months mentoring this guy. And he'd just been, he said, the day before Branham gave that word, we were going through the hospital wards, cleaning them out the day after it. And the general anointing for healing just went from that date. And you'll find that nearly all the ministries just sort of petered out. Um, the ones who got exposed got exposed. Guys like Oral Roberts, the healing part of their ministry sort of went away and he then set up Oral Roberts University and did evangelistic stuff. But the actual revival itself effectively shut down. The only people who saw significant miracles through into the 60s were the people who had a personal walk with the Lord that enabled them to move in that realm. Do you see the difference? The general anointing was gone. So there's only a handful of people who kept going into the 60s. Now, the next major event was what theologians called the second wave of the Holy Spirit. The first wave, of course, was Azusa Street, Pentecostal outpouring. And after the healing revival, there were all these people who'd come from denominational churches who were now exposed to God still doing stuff. And this then spawned what is known as the charismatic movement. And some of the leaders there, uh, who have we got? Um, St. Mark's Episcopal Church of Van Nuys, California. So Dennis Bennett, uh, Larry Christensen, who was Lutheran, and Michael Harper, who was Anglican from the UK. Um, most Now, the problem the Charismatics had, they knew God was still doing stuff, but theologically they had to go to sort of what the Pentecostals believe, like, oh, okay, they're teaching you've got to be speaking in tongues to be saved and that the baptism of the Spirit is a separate event to being baptised and, and all of this sort of stuff. They had no choice but to go to that position and sort of come back to a more theologically sound. But they'd sort of done it this way, and that's significant, okay? Um, and, of course, many of the charismatic churches were forced out by their denominations and had to become independent 65, uh, Branham dies early. Branham had actually spoken to Paul Kane uh, a full year before he died, and he said, Brother Paulie, the Lord's going to take me home soon. He said, my disciples are starting to say that I'm the Elijah, the end-time Elijah, and he said, you know, they're setting me up as an antichrist. He actually publicly rebuked them. And there's an audio recording of it. So all these people who are claiming that Branham said that himself, they, they, they don't know. They're very lazy and haven't checked things out. Um, but Branham himself believed it. And that's significant. And because he believed that, oh, the Lord won't let anyone challenge his glory, he's going to take me home soon, the, the devil was able to take him out. And the events are extraordinary. So... Uh, 1965, this massive car crash, that's an actual photo. Uh, Branham was thrown through the windscreen. His leg, I think, was tucked in the steering wheel or, or just broken. Uh, the kids came running up from the car behind and said, Dad, Dad, you know, you OK? And they said, forget me, how's your mother? And they said, oh, she's gone, Dad. There's no signs of life. He said, put a hand in mine. And so they put a hand in his, and he prays, you know, Father, Lord, send us, send us mother back. Do I put it up there? No, send us, send us back mother, and she's raised. Comes back to life. And Billy Paul, his son, is saying to him, Dad, say the word, say the word. And he wouldn't. He turned his back. And he died, I think, six days later, whereas Mida recovered and lived for years afterwards. Uh, my personal suspicion is that because of his incorrect teaching he believed a lie and allowed in that sense 
allowed, gave the devil an opportunity to take him out before his time. I believe that. It happens to prophetic people. They're not, they don't know everything. The Bible's quite clear. We know in part, we prophesy in part. Um, and it was a tragedy. 1970, the death of A.A. A. Allen. And now, back in the 55, 56, around there, the Assemblies of God wanted Allen to go into their church buildings. The problem was the church buildings weren't big enough for the crowds that were coming. They needed huge stadiums and tents and everything else. But the real issue was that if it was held in the church, they got a share of the tithe money. Right? And so he wouldn't, so they started opposing him. So in fall 55, Knoxville, Tennessee, Alan was doing these meetings and there's a cafe on the way and he'd go in and get a milkshake. And he, he went in this one day and he said, oh, that, that milk tasted a bit off. And, oh, it could have just been on the turn. You, you know, so driving down the road, Alan said, I've got to pull over, I can't drive. Pulls over, gets out of the car and suddenly, out of nowhere, the police, the media and the pastors of the enemy denominations all show up and uh, try and brand him as an alcoholic. They, um, so the stories there, the people who were there, the medical examiner when he actually died said it was a heart attack. It certainly wasn't alcoholism as people claimed. Uh, in 2006, the former AOG pastor publicly repented. I think it was one of, um, what's her name? White hair, prophetic Canadian woman. Launched Todd Bentley. Short white hair. Patricia King. Uh, one of Patricia King's meetings, and he, he publicly repented for spiking Alan's drink. He said, I was led astray by men I trusted. Um, so late 60s to late 70s. Now, I got born in 66, so I'm a kid growing up during this. I had no idea this was rather extraordinary time, um, really, until fairly recently. You know, I just thought it was normal. We went to beach mission, we preached the gospel, people gave their hearts to the Lord. It was like, yeah, you know, thanks for coming. That's what it was. The Jesus People Movement, it was a groundswell movement linked to the hippie counterculture saw the birth of contemporary Christian music, um, thousands of people just making commitments, getting baptised. Uh, various individuals just had a revelation of Jesus, their lives changed, set up halfway houses and coffee shops. and you know, They'd go down the beach with the guitar and singing choruses like God can do it again. You know. um, it birthed Calvary Chapel, which was uh, Chuck Smith's teaching and Lonnie Frisbee's power evangelism, which later in, uh, directly influenced the vineyard. Now, names such as Keith Green, Arthur Blessett, the guy used to carry a cross everywhere, Barry Maguire, another artist, Larry Norman, Dave Hunt, all of these guys came, were, came out of the whole Jesus people movement. And um, there, there wasn't a huge focus on... The miraculous. It, it was just wasn't it. It was just salvation. So people getting saved. And for us in evangelical churches, we didn't know any better. We'd been taught God doesn't do that anymore. So people were getting saved. We're preaching the gospel. That's all we have to worry about. So 1975, August the 8th, 1975, Bob Jones. Uh, the Lord, so his whole life he'd had these visions and stuff and it, it scared him. When he was seven years old, Gabriel gives his face blows his two thing trumpet and he freaks and runs away from the Lord for years. Eventually the Lord brings him back. So 75, he's, I think in a Baptist church, the Lord's been giving him prophetic words about abortion and homosexuality. And he was saying, abortion's going to get to a place where you'll just take a pill and it'll kill the baby in the womb. Tick. And he said, homosexuals, they're going to be near government. They're going to be demonstrating in the streets. And the church at the time was, ah, oh, that'll never happen. Yeah, come on, get serious. And, and uh, he's driving in his truck one day and uh, Satan appears on the manifests on the seat next to him. Like, seat goes down, manifests. And, you know, if you don't stop prophesying against abortion and homosexuality, I'm going to kill you. And Bob's like, yeah, I know who you are. I don't work for you no more. You can't touch me. You know, and Satan left. He said, found out how wrong I was. Uh, <laughs> he said, the next day, a couple of the sisters from the church rang up and said, tell us again what the Lord's been showing you. So he just told them over the phone, didn't, didn't think twice. And um, 
that later that day he was out pulling a stump with his son and every system in his body started to shut down. He was bleeding from every orifice. Incredible pain. And um, it went through to Friday night and all of a sudden the pain's gone. And he said, I'm standing in a tunnel. And there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel. And I knew it was Jesus at the gates of heaven. And he said, there was a, a faceless man standing next to me. And he said, I'd seen the faceless man in dreams and visions. It had always terrified me because I didn't understand what it meant. I now knew it was the Holy Spirit who is not no face, just some guy, you know, an indistinct guy. And because the Holy Spirit's role is to point you to Jesus. Right? And his first thought was, have I messed my garment? And he's like, I'm scared to look. And the Holy Spirit said, it's okay, Bob, you can look. And he looks down, he said, I'm in this spotless white robe. And he said, oh, thank you, Lord. You brought me out of such sin and you kept me clean. And the Holy Spirit leads him down. And as he gets close, he can see that in front of Jesus, there are two lines of people and the long line on the left. And they're like on an airport travelator, you know, those things where you just sort of carry on. And they're wrapped in whatever it was they'd worshipped on earth. He said there was one guy wrapped in sod, earth, because he worshipped his yard. You know? And these people would come along. They would see the Lord and have a witness of the truth and then it would just go down. You know? And he said the much shorter line in front of Jesus. And um, he said people would come up to him. He'd ask them a question, give them a kiss, and they'd go into heaven. And he said, of all the things you'd think the Son of God would ask you at the gate of question, the only uh, gate of heaven, the only question was, have you learned to love? And he said, you can't lie. There's one old lady there. She sort of said, oh, only you, Lord. My husband died young and I got bitter. And, and the Lord said to him, you kept trusting in me for salvation, so you got in by the skin of your teeth, but you don't have much reward. You know. And Bob said, my turn came. He said, I was just about ready to pucker up. The Lord put his hand up and said, no, Bob. And he said, first time in my life I had it made. And the Lord said, no, Bob, I want you to go back. He's like, no, Lord, I don't want to go back. There's pain back there. It hurts. It was so hard to get here, you know. And the Lord said, look over there. And he turns around and he said, I'm now in front of the people going to hell. I can see their faces as they see the Lord and the realisation hits them. He's real and I got it wrong. It's too late. There's no hope. It's just, you know, and he said, you know, uh, and the Lord actually said to him, you know, you, you always were a bit of a coward. He said, but you had a heart for souls. Look over there. And he sees this. He said, Lord, I'd go back for just one. And then Jesus prophesied. Now, remember, this is 75, population around 3 billion. And the, Jesus said, I don't want you to go back for one. I want you to go back for 1 billion. In the year 2000, when there's 6 billion people on the face of the earth, I'm going to begin a work. When it's completed, over a billion souls will be swept into the kingdom, three great waves. You ought to go back and prepare the leaders of the church. Yeah, no pressure. So the billion soul harvest. Around the same time, or just the year after, Catherine Kuhlman dies. Now, as a Sydney Anglican, I didn't really know anything about Catherine Kuhlman at all. Uh, she wasn't discussed. You know. uh, Smith Wigglesworth, books about Wigglesworth started appearing in Kurong, so we sort of knew that people had walked in this stuff and Wigglesworth, you know, things happened and wow and all that, but never heard this name until a lot later. She intentionally distanced herself, uh, rarely prayed for individuals herself. She focused on creating an atmosphere of worship and faith where the Holy Spirit was welcomed and healing would just break out, uh, which was very vineyard. We'll get to that. So just praising God, not asking for a single thing, just praising him. It always brings the power. It's pleasing to the Lord. You don't manipulate the Holy Spirit. She was diagnosed in a heart problem in 55, kept working and uh, died after heart surgery in 76. 77, Bob Jones has this major vision called the Sands of Time. He said, uh, I'm looking back down a beach that stretches back through time, right? all the ages of time. And he said, I can see Jesus walking along the beach, sort of striding along the beach you know, with his purposes. And he said, people from every age are there and, and, and they're trying to 
to step in Jesus' footsteps, but they're having to try and leap to do it and they're not really making it. And, and every so often he'd stop and he'd point to the sand and, oh, it's us, it's our generation, it's us. And they go and they dig furiously and they find this tin box, you know, so it's us, it's us, it's us. And they open it and it's empty. Yeah, you know, time after time, all the generations. And uh, anyway, Jesus walks up to Bob and he said, I want you to dig there. And Bob's like, mm, okay, fine. Dig, 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 tin box, and Jesus said, open it. And Bob's not expecting anything, right? He's, he opens it and he said it was chock full of draft notices. You know, had a person's name. You have been drafted into the end time army of God. And Jesus said, these are my draft notices. I'm going to start sending them out when the US Post hits 21 cents, I think it was, 21 cents, which happened in 1981. And so Bob maintained that the children born since 1981, that, that particular generation group, are the army of God. They're not there yet, but they're going to be. Um, and he said the ones born from 73 when abortion became legalised, they're the deliverers. Now, of course, those of us who don't quite fit into those time frames can feel the tad left out. What the Lord put on my heart is it's linked to them, it's not limited to them. You always have the ability to walk into stuff by faith. Um, and he said, the Lord said to him, I'm going to glorify myself in the last days more than anything they've ever seen. These are the children of promise. Now, they're also known as the generation of the righteous. And one day I'm going to teach on that um, because that's a biggie all by itself. They will walk with God and carry his power to the world. So 77 to 82, John Wimber um, most of you should have heard the name John Wimmer and have a, a, even a vague, even though you're Pentecostals, you should have a vague familiarity with everything God did. Um, so Wimber was a founding member of the Righteous Brothers. Uh, 63, he started reading the Bible and got saved, funnily enough, and went along to a very funny story. He went, said, well, we want to follow Jesus, we better go to church. And I went on to church and he said, I kept waiting for them to do the stuff. And, you know, they sort of finished the service. Everyone went home. And, oh, okay, it must be an off week. Came back the next week and same thing. And after the third week, he went up to one of the uh, deacons and he said, look, when are you guys going to do the stuff? And the guy's like, what do you mean? It's California. So, you know. um, he said, well, the stuff that Jesus did, you know, healings, miracles, raise the dead, you know. Oh, we don't do that anymore. We just sing about it. And it's really interesting because people who read the Bible expect God to do it again, right? And then they go to theological college and get told, on, oh, no, he doesn't do that anymore. You, know, you actually have to be trained in cessationalism. Um, 76, they had a home group where they were seeking more of God. Uh, 77, uh, because of Calvary Chapel's experience with the Holy Spirit, they... They joined and became your Belinda Calvary Chapel. 78, <laughs> the Lord had him teach on Luke and he said, you can't teach on Luke without teaching on the healing ministry of Jesus. The problem is the people out there don't know that you don't really believe it. And they all wanted to start praying for the sick and it's like, oh, well, we have to be obedient. So uh, they start praying. Nothing happens. And people who were there during the time said, you know, we're in this um, gymnasium, we had a curtain and you know, you go out the back to pray for people after the service and no one's getting healed. And one of the um, leadership team was so frustrated. One day he walked out, I'm not going behind that blankly blank curtain ever again. You know? He's driving home and the Lord drops this Bible verse on his heart. So he gets home, goes his Bible out, looks it up. The Lord dwelleth behind the curtain. <laughs> so... Um, after 10 months, Wimber got called out to this young guy who just got saved with his family and he said, look, I need you to come and heal my wife. She's really sick. I've just got a new job. I can't stay. I've got to go. You know. So he walked in and he said, mate, this woman was sick. He said, I know this because there's not a woman on the planet who would allow you to see her looking that bad unless she was genuinely ill. You know, and he, he sort of mumbled a prayer for her and turned around and starts explaining to the husband why it is sometimes people don't get healed when we pray. Suddenly he notices the guy's not looking at him as you're looking over his shoulder. Turns around, the woman's in a, in a coat and pulling up the bed. And, you know, he said, 
what are you doing? She said, you healed me. He said, I did. <laughs> and he was driving home, just went, yeah, we got one. You know, and he had this vision. He said it was like the whole sky was covered with honey and it was just oozing and dripping these huge blobs of liquid gold. And he, he was so surprised. He just said, what's that? And the Lord said, that's my mercy. There's more than enough for everyone. Don't you ever accusing me of not having enough. And um, so by 1980, they had about 400 people in their uh, Yorba Linda Calvary Chapel. Then they had Lonnie Frisbee, who was sort of uh, one of the signs and wonders guy from the Jesus People movement. His story is like he struggled with homosexuality his whole life, ended up dying of AIDS. And yet he was preaching there. He put his hand in, come Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit just went kaboomba. They grew from 400 to 1700 in three months. That's what started the whole of the third wave uh, outpouring, right? Three months. You think about it. And Wimber said, yeah, it was wild. He said, we'd have kids. They'd go to McDonald's after church and they're praying for their friends in the McDonald's car park and all these kids are getting saved. They want to come and get baptised in the swimming pool. And, you know. and he said, what was really funny was we then got asked to go to this conference in England. Uh, so I'd taken half of these kids who'd been saved off the street, never been a traditional church. And they're my ministry team. You know, and so we go to this service in St Paul's Cathedral and he said, mate, I was ready to slip my wrist. He was, oh, oh Lord, thou no, you know. And uh, he said it was just deathly and uh, I couldn't wait to get out of the place. And he said, we're trying to get out and all the kids are like, where's the bookshop, where's the bookshop? And I'm like, what? They said, man, this prayer book, we've got to have a copy. And I went and bought copies of the prayers so they could learn them and pray them themselves at home. And I was going through my, I'm so sick of the prayer book stage, and the Lord really spoke to me through that story. He said, you know, there was a lot of prayer in crafting how the services went together and how it got put in the prayer book because people weren't educated. So by going through this format every week, by saying the prayer of absolution, of, you know, prayer of repentance and all of this, you're actually training and teaching the people in what it's all about. So I had to repent. Um, 1982, the Lord began to train them in deliverance, which caused problems with Calvary Chapel. And so they linked up with what was, at the time, the fledgling vineyard movement, uh, headed by a guy called Ken Gullickson, who had, guess who, Keith Green as one of his deacons. And Brent Rue once told a story. He said, you've got no idea what it was like having Keith Green on your leadership team. He said, that guy was intense. Um, uh, 1978... Uh, Boise, Idaho, another little blob in the middle of nowhere, and out of the blue, angels start visiting this pastor, Roland Buck. If you've ever read the book Angels on Assignment or The Man Who Talked With Angels, it tells the story. Literally, he's there, and all of a sudden, this angel, and he said, who are you? And he said, I'm mentioned in Matthew, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And, it's like, and he, ends up, he eventually met Michael, you know, but what was interesting was that the message was that God cares. And if only one member of your household is living for God, each individual is highly favoured. And a host of angels is sent to bring these highly favoured people to God. So they'll hasten them to a point of choice. If they choose wrong, they start again. Now that's a good message. That's a good message. That's encouragement. Uh, 82 to 88, uh, Mike Bickle and KCF. Now, at the same time as all that's happening in California, Mike Bickle's a young pastor. Uh, he's been basically called to go to uh, Kansas City and take over this young people's church. And he'd had a couple of prophetic things happen. He had this guy, Augustine, who he knew was prophetic and heard the Lord really clear. And Augustine had said to him, mate, you're going to have to deal with a false prophet when you get there from the beginning, you know. And so Mike's sort of on the lookout, you know. And after they've been there a couple of months, Bob Jones shows up. Now, Bob is the most like Ezekiel of anyone we, we, we've ever heard about. Everything was visions and dreams and weird stuff and prophetic signs and, you know. And um, so Mike was just like, mm, I think that could be it. And so... Bob ends up saying to him, look, the Lord's given me a word for you. Can I come and see you? So they, they arranged to meet. And he said, 
Bob walks into his office and he's, oh, thanks for coming, so, it's so good to meet you. And Bob's just like looking at his hands going, yep, yep, them's the ones, this is what I saw, you know, just totally off the planet, you know. And my sister's like, oh. And Bob's telling him all this stuff. He said, you know, um, you're actually going to end up over in Grandview. The Lord says you're going to be right next to Harry S. Truman. And Mike's like, Bob, I can't see that happening. You know, our um, people don't even shop over in Grandview. And Bob's like, they will. Lord said so, you know. And um, at the end of it, Mike was thoroughly unconvinced that Bob was hearing God at all. He said, hey, that's my false prophet. And Bob just said to him, on the first of spring when the snow melts, we'll be sitting around the table in fellowship and you will accept me as a prophet of the Lord. And Mike's like, thanks for coming. So anyway, um, March the next year, uh, Mike's friend Art Katz, who was a Masonic Jew, real intellectual guy, Art had flown in to preach. And this snowstorm, all the snow had gone, this snowstorm comes out of nowhere, dumps snow everywhere, so Art can't fly out, he has to stay around. At the end of the meeting, Mike looks over and he sees Art in a very intense conversation with Bob Jones. He's like, yeah, Art will sort him out, you know. And Art comes up to him and goes, mate, that man is a prophet of the Lord. I've got to have more time with him. Where can we go? So they end up round at Bob's place and they're sitting there right through till midnight, you know, and just fellowshipping and Bob's chair and stuff. And all of a sudden, Bob turns to Mike and he said, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. And Mike is just, what? What did you say? Mike's brother, Donnie, was disabled. And when his father was on his deathbed, he was like, oh, you know, Mike's like, Dad, you just need to rest. It's okay. We've got it. Oh, but what about Donnie? He said, I'll, I'll look after Donnie. And he said, but he's such a heavy burden. And Mike said, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. And he said, I had never told a living soul what I'd promised to my dad. And this Bob Jones speaks it to him. He goes, mate, you are a prophet of the Lord. And Bob... <laughs> Typical Bob, he's like, what's happening outside? My son, you know, I've just, you know, he said, well, the snow's melting. And Bob said, what's the date? 21st of March. So it's the first of spring, the snow's melting. You've just accepted me as a prophet of the Lord. We're sitting around the table in fellowship. And Mike's like, okay. And you can only imagine what it's like having someone like that in your church. People used to say to Mike, you know, what's the advantage of profits? He'd say, well, without profits, your losses will be very great. Um, and as you go through the 80s, um, you know, Bob, Bob actually saw, he said there's going to be people in China, they're going to have unplugged TV sets and they're going to be out in the field watching our services. He said some of them, they're going to have them on their wrists. I mean, he, this is early 80s. He saw all this stuff. Um Anyway, lots of stuff went on. But Bob would actually get words, you know, Noel was coming and they're like, what? And then this boat, Noel Alexander shows up, joins the leadership team. You know, same thing with John Paul Jackson. Uh, the Lord told them. He said, Bob walks into his office one day, he said, there's a group of kindergartners over on the West Coast. And he said, the Lord's going to bring us together and we're going to bless them and they're going to bless us and the kingdom's going to benefit out of it. And Mike's like, great, let's go. And, he said, and Bob's like, no, 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 stop. He says, not time yet. And Mike's like, but you said they were kindergartners. Bob said, yeah, we're still in nappies. <laughs> Perspective. Um, April 1987, Mike finally meets this guy, Paul Kane, he'd been hearing about. And Paul confirms the meeting place that, where they were meeting, that building, was where he saw the vision, Joel's army now in training. He'd had this repeating vision over the years of this building with a sign out the front, Joel's army now in training. And uh, October 87, Bob tells Mike, John Wimber will call him in three months. January 88, Wimber invites Mike to speak to his staff and that's how KCF and the vineyard cross-pollinated. Bricky? He was out the back. Do we want to keep going or? Do we want to keep going or yeah. call it short? Yeah. Okay. So 82 to 93, which was really the, the power years of the third wave. Now, so Lonnie Frisbee, come Holy Spirit, kaboom. Conference ministry began all over the world. Power evangelism, power healing, holding the sons of the Lord, spiritual warfare was one I went to. Um, 
1987, Jack Deere leaves Dallas Theological Seminary and joins the Vineyard, and that was the first Australian conference in Canberra. Now, Mum and Dad, we'd, our personal story here, um, Dad was ready to resign from the ministry. Uh, all the evangelism st- courses and things he'd done just weren't working at Northbridge. People didn't need God. They had money. And um, he was really depressed. And unbeknownst to everyone, the, uh, the rector's warden had been sneaking off to these charismatic prayer conferences with intercessors for Australia. Yes. And uh, he offered for mum and dad to pay for mum and dad to go. And they were so depressed, they thought, well, we might as well have a look. And of course, God blew their socks off. And we started going to the healing ministry at St Andrew's Cathedral. And people would talk about this guy, John Wimber. They'd had conferences in New Zealand. And mum and dad ended up going to England to Acts 86 in Birmingham uh, at the invitation of Michael Green. And Michael said, oh, no, don't go to New Zealand. Uh, Come and be our guest because we've got our renewal week at Oxford and you can be our guest. And then John and I are both speaking at Acts 86. So that's what they did. And uh, Dad made the Canberra conference. I had uni and couldn't go, and I was not amused, you know, because at the time we were living on these tapes and things that were coming. Uh, 88, um, 88, John Wimber goes back, and all of a sudden all the prophets are ringing up with specific words about vineyard leaders, not just in that church, all through the vineyard movement, who were in sin. And it was like, this man, he sits at his desk and he's got a photo of this here and he looks out over numbers such and such and he's doing this with this person. And yeah, just the whole thing, it was just bedlam right through the year. And about midway through the year, Brent Rue was saying, we're we're at a Vineyard Leadership Conference and um, uh, just the leaders gathered around. We're about to sign the documents to become a denomination. And... uh, uh, Jack Deere walks in there. Oh, I just got off the phone with Paul Kane. He said, I do not believe this is the Lord. And if anyone wants to disagree, let them stand and God will judge between us. And Brent's like, oh my God, we're going to die. You know, Wimber's just like, right, we're not going to do it. Tore it up. And uh, people have said the heart of this guy was just incredible. He just wanted to do what God wanted. And, uh, but the prophetic words were the, the vineyard was lean on holiness. And a bit later on, Jack walks into John's office and said, look, this prophet, Paul Cain, he wants to come and see you. He says he's got a word for the Lord from you. And John's like, oh, here's a list of dates. Tell him to pick the day he wants to come. And Jack said, yeah, well, about that. He said to tell you that the day he arrives, there'll be an earthquake in your area as a sign that his coming's from the Lord. And the word of the Lord is Jeremiah 33, verse 8. Not 33.3, 33, which is grace, grace, grace. Okay, And um, he said there's something else significant about the, the, the day, the time. He doesn't know what it is, but he'll know when he gets here. And now Jack had actually run, run back and said, is that the big one everyone keeps talking about in California? And Paul Cain said, no, but after I leave, there'll be a major earthquake somewhere else in the world because what the Lord initiates when I come to the vineyard will end up shaking the rest of the world, which happened. So um, anyway, uh, early December 1988, Paul Kane has just asked to meet with the leadership of Kansas City and he said, the Lord needs to deal with some stuff. He's going to make your leadership white as snow and as a sign, there'll be snow on the ground. And again, all the snow had gone. The day he's arriving, there's snow all over the ground. You know, That's the Monday. He's flying into the vineyard in California. I think it was the Wednesday. Anyway, John Wimber wakes up in the morning, he puts on the news, earthquake, 3.38 a.m. Jeremiah 33, verse 8, 3.38 a.m. Completely spins out, dials Mike Bickley, he said, did that snow thing actually happen? Mike said, yes, it did. He said, we've just had an earthquake. He said, he's going to be here in an hour. What can I do? Mike's like, well, you could try prayer and fasting. That always works. You know? And John's like, I'm going to die. You know? Anyway, they, they had a, a, a wonderful time and, and Brent Rue told some funny stories. He said, you know, there's his word going around, don't get too close to Paul Kane, or he'll read your mind. And he said, Paul must have been laughing himself silly because he can pick you up across the country if he needs to. Um, and that's how we met the prophets and soon after that they did a conference with Paul Kane with all the Kansas City guys and I had the tapes and all that and it was Wow. Um, 1990, they came to Australia for the first time. It was the only time Paul Kane ministered prophetically in Australia, as in calling people out. I was in the Horden Pavilion. We've seen Raf do it. 
same sort of thing, but wow. I, I, I never forget this. You're just wow. And you're sitting there just with chills. Like, and so half the congregation are like, this is God, pick me. And the other half are like, this is God. You know, it's really funny. <laughs> And in 1990, they went to England and Paul Cain gave a word about revival breaking out in England. He didn't say when, and of course, when it didn't happen in six months, they all started ringing up and complaining and carrying on. And um, of course, when the Toronto blessing broke out, that was the fulfilment of what Paul Cain had prophesied. But by that time, Wimber had backed off on the prophetic, uh, prompted a fallout with Jack Deere and eventually with Kansas City. 95, he, when the Toronto blessing had happened, he basically gave them an ultimatum. You're not ministering in the vineyard way, what we've taught around the world, and so you've got to make a choice. They said, fine, we're going to go with what God's doing, we'll leave. And then um, died not long after in 97. One of the words Bob Jones had had for John was Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, the recovery of the harp of worship, the goose that laid the golden eggs was healing, and the final thing was he was to mobilise the church to lay the axe to the roots. And that never happened. And I, personally, I think he dropped the ball at the end. And I may be wrong. You know, I pray about this a lot, Lord. You know. But that's, what, that's my analysis of what I believe happened because the things that he was called to do didn't happen. 87, Rick Joyner um, had the vision of the harvest. Um, you can buy that if you haven't read it. You need to read it. Uh, the Harvest is at the end of the age. It was a three, two and a half day prophetic experience and he was given a detailed parano- uh, panorama of what's to come. And that opened doors and linked him into everything. Paul Kane's re-emergence after the 25 silent years, the Lord had said to him, go visit evangelical leaders. I'll bring you the one who will give you a platform for your re-emergence into ministry. So he visited Yongi Cho and Oral Roberts and um, Jimmy Swaggart before he fell. And the Lord showed him what was going to happen to Jimmy Swaggart but wouldn't let him say anything. Interesting. And um, turned out to be John Wimber. So just after the earthquake month, the next month he's in a plane over LA and the Lord said, John Wimber's the man, go back there. And uh, when they were in Sydney in 1990 the famous briefing article, which is just appalling and he's still doing the rounds in Anglicanism. And uh, it was just full of lies. And Wimber's comment was, we've met the Pharisees. Um, Yep, so Wimber backed away from the prophetic. 83 to 97, the prophetic history of Toronto. Amazing what happened. It was all, the Lord had told Bob Jones, 1983 is in Randy Clark's church. When the Missouri River flows backwards, revival will break out in your church. It's like saying Sydney Harbour is going to go backwards. You know, it's like, what does that mean? Of course, 1993, those huge rainstorms across Midwestern America, so much rain flooded down the Mississippi, the Missouri flowed backwards. At the time, Randy Clark's dry and burned out and hears about this laughing revival. And um, so... He, he goes to this one place he's ever publicly spoken about um, and gets prayed for and the rest is history. The vineyard pastors hear about it, breaks out in his church. They say, we need that. John Arnott gets him up to Toronto and it goes worldwide. And Rick Joyner was saying recently that more people have come to Christ as a direct result of the Toronto outpouring than in the whole of the wretched church, rest of church history put together. Um, and I was there. I mean, I'm not going to go into it now because we are out of time. So it just blew out. My personal experience, it was really like the first year you just can't describe. It was just like Holy Spirit bombs, you know, and hang on for the ride. And by mid-95, it was very clear the tide was going out, and that's when I had the tidal wave visions We'll save them for later. Um, 95, Rick Joyner starts getting the Final Quest revelations, these ongoing prophetic experiences. We're actually living the first part of this. The last 15 years is the hordes of hell are marching. And uh, is there anybody here who hasn't been beaten up over the last 15 years? 
because the Lord's allowing us to go through training. 95, Brownsville Revival. Most of you know this stuff, so I'll flick through it quickly. 96, Heidi Baker, completely burned out, goes to a conference at Toronto, has this ongoing experience with Jesus, goes back to Mozambique, everything starts happening over there. We've had friends go over there and see a whole village saved one day. You know, bread multiplied, you know, they buy bread by the truckload. Uh, Bethel gets involved, launches Jesus Culture. 2000, guess what the population hits? Six billion. 2001, the postman's letter uh, message where Bob shared a lot of those revelations. Uh, now, he'd been told you are not to visit these three cities, Kelowna, Canada, Albany, Oregon, and Redding, California, until I give you permission. February 2001, the angel shows up, this is the year you can go, gets invited to the Dunamis Conference. They share the stuff at the Postman's Letter uh, message, which, again, will be on our website again when we can. And, uh, but the Lord said, these three eagles' nests with these baby eagles I'm going to use. And Reading's Bethel, Albany Vineyard, Albany Origin, Oregon, and Kelowna was Wes Campbell. Todd Bentley, the Florida, the Lakeland Revival, pretty much everyone's familiar with, was all on God TV. Um, now, this is the last bit, and I'll just skim through it pretty quick. The last 10 years, nearly all of the major prophetic voices have died. So the guy whose main message was, have you learned to love, dies on Valentine's Day 2014. Now, it's amazing how many, of the others, how, how many things happen in February. Um, anyway... Uh, the night he's dying in the hospital, the hospital administrator is a Christian. He sort of knows about Bob, but he's conservative, so he doesn't want to see him. He, 3 a.m. in the morning, there's been bedlam going. He's totally burned out, fallen asleep on his desk. He hears the key lock to his office, and there's only two people that have the code. Bob walks in. Bob's got broken legs. He can't move. Walks in, gives him all this revelation and stuff. And uh, it turns out he's writing notes. And when he wakes up in the morning, it's written in perfect ancient Aramaic. 2015, John Paul Jackson dies. 2015, Jeremiah Johnson has a dream of the attack on the prophets. And he specifically mentions uh, Kim Clement and uh, John Paul Jackson. And said he, he's told in the dream they died before their time. And uh, they'd stepped into an area the Lord had not ordained. In, they'd attacked the enemy, a principality, and exposed themselves, and they didn't have the covering. Um, Kim Clement, I forget exactly what it was. It's in Jeremiah Johnson's prophetic word. Oops, that way. Paul Cain died last year, and, you know, people heard about his fall. He went through restoration, repentance, and was, you know, a, the guys who were working with him said he finished well. And Kari Browning then shared this post about all these things that happened in February, which I put on the Facebook page. And this is us. Recurring vision Paul Kane had for years of these stadiums. And he said he would see um, a commentator come on the news. Well, folks, there's no news to report tonight, but good news. He said... There's not even any sporting events. They've been cancelled for lack of interest. And he said, instead, all the stadiums are filled with people that have spontaneously gathered to worship God. And we don't know who's leading it. We don't know these people. They're just standing there. Some of them have been there for three days with no food or drink or, or change of clothes. And they're just announcing, we've got a resurrection here. And yeah, he'd seen this regularly over the years. We're on the verge of the first wave of the billion soul harvest. Civil war in the church. Um, we're, we're already seeing stuff happening because the battle lines are being drawn. Like the American Civil War, it needs to be won and it needs to be done without demonising the enemy. One of the things the Lord said in that vision I shared the other week, no one will be used to build a kingdom if they've got their brother's blood on their hands. Okay? Right, we'll end it there. Read the final quest. <laughs> okay. Um, if anyone wants to ask more about the bits at the end, we'll talk about it later. It's gone on longer than we'd expect. What, what? Communion. Yeah. Let's commune. Let's do it the old way. Everyone come up. Grab the bits. We'll do it at the front.
Oh, there's two. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Ella, do not drop the grape. My Ella, she wouldn't do that. She used to all the time. <laughs> She's Just stand at the front and we'll gather round. We're going old school today. Now, all of that's about honouring the fathers because whenever you're building something new and the Lord's about to build his house and it's built on the foundation and Ephesians says the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone, right? So the foundations and the people God's used to do things in the past are relevant to us now, right? And, and we need to honour that. Now, like I said, we're, we're going to try and get the website restocked with everything. Um, so you should be able to do your own research and reading and whatnot. If you want to know some of the books and things you can get on some of these people, just ask me at the end. Okay, a few stragglers. Everyone got communion? Yep. Right. Thank you, Father. Lord Jesus. You gave your body for us to cleanse us of sin. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. One body. Thank you, Lord. And the fruit of the vine, the spirit to bind us together, to teach us all things, to lead us into all truth. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that cleanses us.